Okay, so greetings to everyone. And um, we are having our, our meeting of the colloquium, uh, quantum contextuality in quantum mechanics and beyond. And uh, uh, today's speaker is uh, uh, Matt Jones of University of Colorado. Uh, we are, uh, I'm very pleased to, uh, to have him as a speaker today. And, uh, and he will be uh, talking today about a causal model approach to contextuality for systems with disturbance. So uh, Matt, you can begin. All right. All right, well, thanks, Eddie. Um, it's a pleasure to be speaking to this group today. Um, so, let me get a. I'll have the chat window up in case anyone wants to interrupt. And there we go. So, as I think everyone in this group knows, standard contextuality in the Bell and Coach and Specker traditions. Um, is restricted to systems without disturbance, meaning that observables have the same distributions um, in different contexts. Recently, there's been interest in extending the notion of contextuality to systems with disturbance. I think most importantly, because it would allow contextuality um, analysis to apply to other domains outside of particle physics where disturbance is very difficult to avoid. And there are also practical experimental considerations as well. The most prominent theory in this area is the contextuality by default or CBD theory of Javarov and Kuyala, um, which despite being a very elegant mathematical theory is a theory of random variables. It doesn't have the same no-go interpretation that the Bell and Cochin Specker theorems have. And so in particular determination that a disturbing system is contextual under CBD doesn't necessarily come with any physical implications for principles that a system is incompatible with, principles of classicality, locality, et cetera. And so what I wanna talk about today is my efforts to develop such a, such a theory for extended contextuality. My starting point is the notion of direct influence, which informally you can think of as influence from context to measurement outcomes. This plays a central role in the Coach and Specker theorem. It's um, the, the denial of direct influence is a defining characteristic of non-contextual models. Uh, direct influence is also denied um, as, as a premise in, in Bell's theorem, it's parameter independence that follows from space-like separation, the assumption thereof. CBD takes a slightly different approach. It treats direct influence in a probabilistic rather than a causal sense, and it doesn't outright deny it. It places an upper bound on direct influence um, defined by the amount mandated by differences in observable distributions. Closely related is the idea of hidden influence, which is direct influence that is not observable, that doesn't show up in the empirical distributions because it becomes marginalized out. Hidden influence is closely related to the idea of fine tuning uh, in the, uh, the, the theory of, of the no fine tuning approach to contextuality developed by Wooden Speckens and recently uh, elaborated by Pearl and Cavalcanti, whereby independence or conditional independence relations among observables are used to infer the absence of certain causal relations among those observables. Hidden influence is also central to what Cervantes and Jabarov called the no conspiracy principle, whereby uh, direct influences are assumed not to cancel out in empirical distribution, so that's an absence of hidden influence. And so we have uh, this idea appearing at a conceptual and formal level in a number of different places, saying that hidden influences don't arise naturally, and that causal models should not allow for causal connections stronger than are needed to explain the amount of disturbance in the observed distributions. So what I want to do is take these ideas and formalize them within a causal models approach and then use that to define contextuality for um, disturbing systems. So I'm working within the framework of probabilistic causal models, which are a widely used tool in statistics, machine learning. I've used them extensively in my own work in psychology for cognitive modeling. And as, as Cavalcanti has recently illustrated, they're a very useful tool in contextuality because they naturally generalize uh, hidden variables models. So in the present work that I'll uh, present today, 
I'm going to propose formal definitions that quantify direct influence and define uh, whether hidden influence is present in a probabilistic causal model, and then use these definitions to prove a no-go theorem for extending contextuality that has the following form, where the CBD definition of contextuality is equivalent to a model-based contextuality that I call M-contextuality, um, whereby a system is M-non-contextual if there exists a model that simultaneously minimizes all direct influences. And then the no-go component of the theorem is that these conditions uh, these definitions have a necessary and sufficient condition, which is that there exists a model with no hidden influences. So this no hidden influence assumption plays an analogous role to assumptions of non-contextuality or locality or local causality in the Bell and Cochran-Specker theorems. And when we, re when we restrict these three equivalent um, conditions to non-disturbing systems, they are equivalent to KS non-contextuality, Cochran-Specker non-contextuality. Um, so they are proper faithful extensions of that theory, as has been shown um, in, the, in the CPD papers, of course. So those results are all, so that'll be the first half of the talk, and those, those results are all for a particular structure of a causal model. And then in the latter half of the talk, I'll talk about uh, what happens when we extend to different kinds of causal structures. And it turns out we get different notions of contextuality depending on what kind of causal relationships we consider. Okay, so with that background out of the way, let's get into the technical details. I take um, a fairly standard setup for contextuality scenarios. So we have a measurement system consisting of a set Q of observables, C of contexts, and this relation uh, between them indicating whether uh, Q is measured in context C. And for each context, we have a joint distribution denoted by mu C over all of the observables measured in that context, so on the product space over the outcomes. Uh, technical assumptions here, I, do, I make very mild assumptions. I allow for, um, I, don't, I don't need anything to be finite for the results I'll present. Uh, the observables just need to be countable as do the contexts and the outcome space for each Q just needs to be second countable. So that includes continuous variables like uh, real valued observables. And then within these measurement systems, we can take the standard definition of contextuality, which I'll refer to as KS contextuality, Coach and Specker. Um, a system is contextual if it has no disturbance, meaning for any set of uh, random variables that are observables that are jointly measured in two different contexts, their distribution is the same in those two contexts. And yet there's no global distribution on all of the observables in the system that's compatible with the, uh, the joint distribution within each context. So the standard definition of contextual. Okay, so now let me introduce probabilistic causal models. Um, as I've said, they are natural extension of hidden variables models that have been used in the development of contextuality. A probabilistic causal model is a directed acyclic graph. It's a set of random variables denoted by X together with this binary dependence relationship that I indicate with this arrow. So this is an example. This is the, the classic um, original Bell scenario where we have um, settings for two observers, measurement outcomes for those observers and a source state. And the key feature of this diagram is that the joint distribution over all the variables in the model factors as the product of conditional distributions of each variable given its immediate parents, the ones that have arrows directly into it. So for this graph, for example, the joint distribution over all five variables factors as the product of the marginals for lambda, little a, and little b, because they have no parents, times the conditional distributions of, um, of, of each measurement outcome given the local setting and the, um, and the hidden state. If we condition on, a, on little a and b and marginalize out lambda, we get the, the classic um, equation from Bell's theorem. Okay, so that's just an illustration of probabilistic causal models. And we'll be looking at these models, you know, more elaborate versions of these. To start off, I'm going to focus on a particular structure for causal models that I'm going to refer to as canonical causal models that uh, capture the, the essence of, of contextuality scenarios. So in these models, um, we have the, the variables, the relevant variables here are a single variable for context, a single hidden state, and then a set of variables, one for each uh, observable. So I let Q index the physical observables and I use F to indicate the random variable in the model. 
And the dependency structure is as shown here. So in general, every observable can depend on both the hidden state and the context. Moreover, in order for the approach to work, I assume that the observables are deterministic functions of their inputs. So I can write FQ as a function of little c and little lambda, the, the current context and, and hidden state. And this, of course, uh, implies no loss of expressive power because if f were a random function, a stochastic function of c and lambda, we could just put this, the, the sample space into lambda. This is essentially Fine's theorem. And then given such a model, we can say that a model is a model for a system M um, if the conditional distribution, or, yeah, the conditional distributions and all the contexts line up. So the conditional distribution in the model matches the conditional uh, distribution um, in the physical system for every context. And this is essentially the same idea as in CBD of probabilistic couplings, which I'll formally introduce in a little bit. So in addition to this general canonical model, we can also talk about context-free models in which there is no causal connection from the context. So C is just a superfluous variable here. These context-free models are the very same thing as Cochin Specker non-contextual models. So that's a, that's a useful other um, special case to consider. On the bottom here, I've just got, for folks familiar with plate notation, this is just a more compact way of writing these models where everything in the box is replicated over all Q and Q. All right, so some basic results um, relating these models to standard contextuality. First of all, let me point out that any measurement system admits a canonical causal model. Okay? Um, if we don't constrain the um, the effects of context, meaning no, no constraints on disturbance or signaling, then, uh, then we can model anything. And this is a fairly straightforward result, but it highlights how restricting signaling in one way or another is essential to any causal approach to, to contextuality. This is, this is central in the Bell and Cochin Specter theorems as well. Um, second, if we restrict to non-disturbing measurement systems, then KS context, non-contextuality is equivalent to the existence of a context-free model. So depending on how you want to think of this, you could see this as a definition because the context-free model is the same as a Cochin Specker non-contextual model. Uh, but the point is that the existence of such a model is equivalent to the existence of a global distribution. And again, this is uh, essentially Fine's theorem. And then third, um, a somewhat technical result. If we look at single observable subsystems, what are called um, connections in the CBD framework. A system has context-free models for all of those single observable subsystems, if and, only it's if and only if it's consistently connected, meaning there's no disturbance for the single observables. And that's an important um, technical lemma for the, the theorems that I'll show in a moment. Okay, so that sort of grounds these causal models in standard contextuality. Now let me um, introduce the notion of my proposed definition of direct influence, which we can use for defining um, contextuality for disturbance systems. So I'm going to define direct influence for any observable and any pair of contexts in which that observable is measured as the probability of latent states or hidden states for which the context, the change of context, affects the measurement outcome. So we look at all lambda such that the value of the observable in context C is different from the value in context C prime. And we look at the probability of all those hidden states. Okay, so what's the probability that we're in a hidden state where a shift of context would uh, change the outcome? And I call that direct influence. So there's a different direct influence for every uh, observable in pair of context. Now, direct influence is hidden if it cancels out, at least partially, in the empirical distributions. So in the case of a finite outcome space, the definition is like this. There's a more, there's a richer measure theoretic definition for the general case, but this gets the intuition. So for a given uh, Q, C and C prime, and some value for Q, we say there's hidden direct influence, hidden influence, if a change from C to C prime changes Q from being V to something else for some hidden states, and does the reverse effect some, from some other value to V, for other hidden states. So you can see this in this diagram when we change from C to C prime. Um, for some lambdas, Q changes in one direction, for other lambdas, it changes in the opposite direction. And this is hidden again, because once we marginalize out lambda, which is unobservable, these effects go away. And so the observable uh, difference in distributions is less than the direct influence. 
So the complementary idea is that of an aligned model, which is a model that has no hidden influences anywhere in the model. And so restrictions to aligned models are a formalization of Cervantes and Javarov's no, cons no conspiracy principle. Denying conspiracies, denying hidden influence is the same as saying, well, we're only going to consider um, aligned models and ask whether uh, a, a system admits an aligned model. Okay, so let me give an example of these definitions using the PR box. Okay, so the PR box is a, is a four cycle. We have four variables, which you can think of as um, a, a bipartite Bell scenario. Um, observer A, observer B, and they're measured in pairs like this. They all have uh, uniform um, marginal distributions, but the four of them together produce uh, a generalized liars paradox where A1 is always equal to B1, which is always equal to A2, which is always equal to B2, but B2 and A1 are always unequal when they're measured together. So this is a maximally contextual system. It of course admits a causal model, that looks like this. So I can assume two hidden states, each with equal probability. And in the bottom half of the table here, I'm showing you the value of every observable um, for each context in which it's observed for the two values of land. So you have the values of, of A1 in its two contexts and B1 and so on. And then we can say, we can look at the direct influence within this model. Well, for A1, there is no direct influence. If we compare the two contexts in which A1 is measured, the value of A1 is the same uh, for, for, each, for each hidden state. The value of A1 is the same regardless of context. So the changes of context do not affect A1. And that's true for A2 and B2, uh, but not B1. So we see that for both hidden states, a change of context changes the value of B1. So the direct influence here is one, the probability is one. And moreover, that direct influence is hidden because the effects of changing from these, between these two contexts go in opposite directions. They change the value of B1 in opposite directions such that they will cancel out. Um, this direct influence cancels out when we look at the observable distribution when we marginalize over land. So the point here is that the PR box, despite admitting the causal model, will only admit a causal model that has um, direct influence, which is greater than is necessary. B1 is, has the same marginal distribution. So we don't need direct influence on B1, but we need it somewhere. We can't have a global model that has no direct influence. And moreover, we can't have um, a model without hidden influence. So that motivates this definition of model-based contextuality, whereby a system is m-contextual um, if any model for that system has some greater influence, some, some direct influence that's greater than is necessary meaning that um, for some triple C, C prime and Q, there exists a different model that has a lower direct influence for that particular triple. Of course, it would have a higher direct influence elsewhere. In other words, modeling the full system requires more direct influence than modeling each observable alone. Likewise, M non-contextuality is just the converse of the existence of a model um, simultaneously minimizing all the direct influences. This is, essentially the same as the definition within CBD, where we have the notion of a probabilistic coupling, a set of random variables SCQ that mirror the MCQ, the observable, um, the physical variables, uh, which are all jointly distributed. And we look at, we define, we, um, Javarov and Kuyala, define direct influence there as the probability of these two variables, again, the same Q for different C primes, differing in that joint distribution. And a system is CBD non-contextual if there exists a coupling that minimizes all of these direct influences. So it's very nearly the same idea. The key difference is that we're looking at direct influence in a causal rather than a probabilistic sense. And this move turns out to be key for the no-go theorem that I'm going to give next. Okay, so some theorems on model-based contextuality. First of all, if we restrict non-disturbing systems, M-contextuality is equivalent to KS-contextuality. This follows from the previous propositions. For a non-disturbing system, the minimum direct influence for each triple is zero. And having a model with all zero direct influences is equivalent to having a context-free model, a KS non-contextual model. Okay, next, um, this, is, this is the no-go theorem that um, an arbitrary system, perhaps with disturbance, is M non-contextual if and only if it, it admits an aligned model. Um, conversely, a system is m-contextual if 
every model contains hidden influence. So this, this is the idea that m-contextuality corresponds to the principle of no hidden influence. And the way the proof proceeds is based on this lemma where we can directly derive the minimum direct influence. It's just equal to the total variation uh, between the two conditional dif distributions in the, two con in the two contexts. And then you can show that a given model minimize, um, minimizes, it reaches this minimum if and only if there's no hidden influence. So that's the sketch of the proof. Okay, relating M contextuality to CBD contextuality. I already gave the definition of probabilistic couplings and multi-maximal couplings, which is what I said are couplings that minimize all of these direct influences, these probabilistic direct influences. And CBD contextuality is the non-existence of such a coupling. So it's straightforward to show that M contextuality is equivalent to CBD contextuality, meaning a system is um, contextual under one definition if and only if it's it is under the other definition. And the proof works by a direct translation between probabilistic causal models and probabilistic couplings that satisfy a quality of all the um, direct influences under the, two, uh, under the two definitions. And then finally, combining theorem three and theorem two, we have the conclusion that a system is CBD non-contextual if and only if it admits an aligned model. So what we've done now is provided a, um, a physical interpretation, a no-go interpretation of CBD contextuality. Embody, we've shown that CBD contextuality embodies the principle of no hidden influence in the same way that Richard Specker contextuality embodies the principle of um, the, that's defined in non-contextual models. Um, Bell non-locality embodies the principle of local causality, et cetera. Okay. So now let me start talking about different graphical models. The models that I've been talking about so far um, basically correspond to a, a Koch and Specker representation where we list, where we, we um, well, let me contrast it with um, these partition systems, which correspond more of a Bell representation. In the Bell scenario, the observables are partitioned among the observers. So the set Q of, um, of all the observables is a disjoint partition of observables available to each of the observers um, in K, observers K. The context likely, um, likewise factor, which each context corresponds to a vector of choices of measurement settings, choices of, of observables, one for each observer K. Um, and so, so given this representation of measurement system, this, this, this Bell partition representation, we can also talk about partitioned models. So in a partition model, I replace the single C variable in the Koch and Specker representation with a set of context variables, one for each observer corresponding to that observer's setting. And I replace the set of observables, one for each observable, now with a single variable for every observer where the value, so I put a tilde on it, the value for the observer's observable, observer case observable is course in the corresponds to the node in the canonical model for whichever observable that observer chips. Okay, so there's a natural translation between these two representations. This kind of model, this partition model and the canonical model that I was talking about previously. There's a one-to-one -one correspondence and properties directly translate between them. And that's going to be important for what I'll talk about next. So in particular, we can now talk about um, a notion of direct influence within these models, which I'll call signaling, because we have we can talk about different observers. So signaling is a direct influence of the settings of all other observers upon the outcome of some given observer. Okay? So if I compare two contexts that match on the setting for observer K, but allow any other observers to change their settings, I can ask what's the probability of hidden states under which the outcome for observer K changes. And that, of course, is equal to the direct influence um, in the in the model for whichever outcome, um, whichever observable that observer is measuring. And moreover, we can then define hidden signaling, which is signaling that cancels out in the observed marginals. Hidden signaling in um, in a in a partition model is equivalent to uh, hidden influence in the corresponding canonical model. Hidden signaling formalizes a notion that was proposed in Ottmann, Schwacher, and Filk, where they distinguish between uh, what they called hidden signaling 
and communicating signaling, communicating signaling being signaling that does show up in the empirical distributions. Um, and they raise this distinction in a critique of CBD, saying that CBD considers only communicating signaling and denies hidden signaling. And, and I mainly agree at a technical level, but I think I give a different interpretation of that, saying that CBD corresponds to the principle of no hidden signal. Okay. So um, here's a general, um, a, a general partition modeling model that allows for signaling. Um, then we have the special case without signaling, and that's, that's a useful distinction to make, and then here's the, the plate notation for those. So for partition models, we have a set of results that parallel the results that I gave for the canonical models. So first of all, any partition system ex admits a partition model if we, don't, um, if we don't restrict signaling at all. And this is actually fully general because you can take any coach inspector scenario and represent it as a partition system um, trivially by just having a different observer for every observable and giving that observer a dummy observ observation, um, a, a dummy observable uh, in context in which they don't make a measurement. So this is fully general. Um, next, proposition five shows that n contextuality in as, as defined previously is equivalent to the corresponding definition on partition models, namely that there exists a partition model that simultaneously minimizes all signal. So minimizing all signaling, it corresponds to minimizing, minimizing all direct influence. And so we have an equivalent definition for partition models. Then the proposition two and theorem one that I showed you earlier um, show that for non-disturbing systems, M contextuality and KS contextuality are both equivalent to the existence of the model without context effects. Likewise, in a partition system, they're both equivalent to the existence of a model without signal. And then finally, um, the, the, the analog to my theorems uh, two through four, which showed that M contextuality and KS contextuality, um, uh, sorry, M, M contextuality and, and CBD contextuality um, are both equivalent to the necess necessity of hidden influence. Theorem five shows that they're both equivalent to the need for hidden signal when we look at, um, at partition models. And all of these results can be proven um, from the previous results just using this natural translation between canonical models, this KS representation, and partitioned models, this Bell representation. So the proofs are all fairly straightforward. Okay, so that's more or less the first half of the talk. And let me give an interim summary. So what I've done is offered um, a quantitative definition of direct influence of context upon observables in these probabilistic causal models and then gone from there to define hidden influence and use those definitions to prove the equivalence of three different definitions of extended contextuality, contextuality for disturbing systems. So there's M contextuality, which is the existence of a model minimizing all direct influences. There's the existence of a um, existence versus non-existence of an aligned model, meaning there's no hidden influence principle. Then there's the definition within CBD. And then all of these, when restricted to non-disturbing systems, of course, reduced to chaos contextual. And I showed all of these results um, under two different forms of graphical models, the canonical models, which is this coach and specker representation, and the partition models, which is this Bell representation. Okay. So now I wanna move on to consider more general models. So these are the models we've considered so far, but there's a whole zoo of other graphical structures we might wanna consider causal connections um, between the observables, intermediating, it, it, uh, mediating hidden variables, and so on. And it's possible that defining contextuality, and I'll talk about what I mean by that, with respect to these other causal structures, could yield different extensions of traditional contextuality, ones that are interesting yet distinct from the extension given by M contextuality and CD. So let me give a motivating example to show how this can happen. Uh, so here's a system. This is a two cycle. We have two observables X and Y that are jointly measured in two different contexts. Each variable has the same marginal distribution in the two contexts, but their joint distribution differs. We have a positive correlation here, a negative correlation here. Um, and this is contextual under CBD and therefore under M contextuality as well, which means there is no aligned model under this graphical structure. In fact, the best I can do doesn't even use that arrow, so I'll remove it just for simplicity. 
So here's more or less the best kind of model you can produce for this physical system where the hidden state is coin flip, X is just determined directly by that hidden state. Y depends on the hidden state, but in opposite directions, depending on context. So that will model the system, but it has hidden influence because this dependence of Y on context goes in opposite directions for the two hidden states. And when we marginalize lambda, um, that effect becomes hidden. So that's an illustration of why this, uh, this system is, is M contextual, CBD contextual. But now let's consider a different causal structure. Let's allow Y to depend on X instead. And actually it doesn't need to depend on Lambda anymore. And we can build what is a model which, which has essentially the same structure. So X depends on Lambda in the same way. And now Y depends on X and C instead of Lambda and C in the same way as before. But because X and C are observed, this dependency is fully observable. There's no more influence here. There's no conspiracy. Right? So one might say that it's not really justified to call the system on the left contextual, at least, not, at least not from a causal models perspective, because here we have this perfectly good model that has no hidden influences or conspiracies of any sort. So it seems to really depend on what causal structure we want to consider. All right. Um, so what I'm going to do now is consider different causal structures and see what sort of uh, forms of contextuality they uh, imply. One key distinction that's going to be important throughout this is the distinction between um, outcome dependence and parameter dependence. And this comes from, this comes out of Bell's theorem. It comes out of Bell's notion of local causality in the second version of his theorem. So here's that graph that I introduced earlier. And here's that factorization condition that is um, the, uh, the key assumption in Bell's theorem that, um, that he argues from local causality. The general expression of, um, of the factorization condition um, for arbitrary numbers of, observ of observers is given here, where the joint distribution over observables is a product um, over individual observers of their outcome conditioned just on the local setting and the hidden state. Now, it was subsequently shown that this factorization condition corresponds to two separate assumptions. One being parameter independence, meaning that FK depends only on CK, but not on the settings of other observers. So it, it excludes dependence of um, capital B on little a and vice versa. But also it ex, um, this, um, this condition holds that the Fs are conditionally independent of one another once conditioned on the settings in the state. Right? So it denies dependence among the outcomes. It denies causal connections between big A and big B. Right? Um, now, so what we've considered so far are these parameter dependencies, but we have not considered outcome dependence. The same analysis applies to Coach and Specker non-contextuality um, by the fine abramsky brandenberger theorem. Um, the, uh, well, Coach and Specker non-contextuality is equivalent to this very same factorizability condition. So even in that scenario, in that setting, we can, uh, we can distinguish between outcome dependence and parameter dependence. And those assumptions are both built into um, Coach and Specker non-contextual non models. Okay. Um, so with those distinctions in mind, let me now introduce this notion of graph-based contextuality or G-contextuality which generalizes the M contextuality um, that I've talked about so far. So I say that a given physical system M is G contextual if modeling M on G requires hidden influence. So I'm using that earlier result that hidden influence, um, the necessity of hidden influence um, is um, necessary and sufficient for M contextuality. I'm, and now I'm going to take that as a definition. So conversely, if there exists a model on G on this graph um, for M that has no hidden influence, then we'll say that M is G non-contextual. So for example, if we consider the canonical causal model, which I now call GPD, the graph of parameter dependence, these cross arrows here, um, then G contextuality with respect to this graph G is the same as M contextuality by definition. And we also know that for non-disturbing systems, it corresponds to, it agrees with KS contextuality. Um, we can also talk about um, outcome dependence. And in this case, we have to talk about a family of different graphs because the dependence can go in different directions. But then we can talk about G-contextuality for graph families and give the same definition. Okay, so the questions then 
are whether different choices of G, different causal structures yield different variants of contextuality. That is, does, diff does consideration of different causal paths change what we classify as a conspiracy and lead to different definitions of contextuality? Or alternatively, do all or most representations of causality yield the same notion of extended contextuality, namely the one given by M contextuality and CBD? This question was in part inspired by the recent work by Pearl and Cavalcanti extending Cavalcanti's 2018 theorem that no fine tuning implies KS non-contextuality for a restricted family of graphical models and showing that it applies to arbitrary graph structures. And so thus I, I wanted to do the same thing here and ask whether the principle of no hidden influence has the same consequence for arbitrary graphs as it does for the canonical and partition models that, that I studied um, and presented just earlier. So if the question to this first, uh, if the answer to this first question is affirmative, meaning that we do obtain different notions of extended contextuality from different graph structures, then we can ask which of them are interesting, sensible, useful, et cetera. The minimal requirement that I want to use here is that alternate definitions of extended contextuality agree with KS contextuality when we restrict to non-disturbing systems. I think that's a minimal requirement that they be faithful to the original concept. And to preview the main conclusions, um, what we find is that other, other graph structures indeed yield alternative extensions of contextuality, non-trivial ones, interesting ones, but ones that are um, all unreasonable in that they fail to agree with KS contextuality. So they don't, they're not faithful to the, to the original notion. So in particular, this canonical graph structure, which I now call um, the parameter dependence graph, um, and then the corresponding notions of M contextuality or CBD contextuality, they seem to be the only well-behaved notion of extended contextuality within this space. So my approach for doing this um, is first to um, give a generalized notion of hidden influence in arbitrary causal models, generalizing the notion of hidden influence from context to observables, and then use that to enumerate the space of all possible graphs, the universe that we have to consider, and then explore the properties of G-contextuality for those graphs. Okay, so let's talk about an arbitrary causal model. So these labels aren't meant to really mean anything except that the white ones following standard convention for these, for these diagrams, uh, the white ones are hidden and the gray ones are observed. So I can define hidden influence for any observed variable in the graph based on its parents and splitting its parents into observed and hidden. So the observed parents are A and B, the hidden ones are lambda and phi. And the idea is going to be to ask whether changes, influences of the observed parents on X become hidden when we marginalize the, um, when we marginalize over the, um, the hidden ones. So I've just been, um, Marian told me that I don't see, he doesn't see the graph. Um, so tell me if it comes back now. Are we good? No, seems to be the same thing, right? Okay, all right, uh, maybe, maybe it was just, um, anyway, I, I got a comment that someone wasn't seeing the graph. Okay, so if things are good, then I'll continue. Um, so in order for this to work, I need X to be, uh, as before, a deterministic function of its parents, um, which I can do by just making the sample space explicit. So um, for example, if X is a probabilistic function of its parents, so say a Gaussian function where the parents are the mean of the variance, I can just explicitly introduce a new hidden variable, which is a standard normal variant and now make X a, um, uh, an algebraic function of the, uh, of the parents. Um, so I'm being told that, is anyone, is anyone besides Marion not seeing my display? He's asking me to zoom out. Uh -huh. I see everything. I don't okay. Know. okay, I'm going to continue. Sorry, Marian. I, I hope uh, I hope it's um, something that you can resolve. And so now um, I'm going to consider hidden influence of any change in the parents um, for different values of the um, of the hidden. Um, uh, 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 sorry, different uh, for changes of the observable parents uh, for different values of the the hidden parents. So this just directly generalizes the definition of hidden influence as given before. So there are some values of the hidden parents. This is, a, this is a vector of all the hidden parents for which a change of specific change of the observed parents from C to C prime changes the outcome in one direction from B to something else. And there are other values of the hidden parents that yield the opposite change 
So once again, um, the probability that the parents' values can change the result is greater than what's evident in the uh, observable differences. And again, this is a, this is sort of a simple definition for discrete outcomes for discrete x. Um, but there's a there's a more general measure theoretic measure theoretic definition for the general case. Okay. Um, so one tricky thing that we have to deal with is this, is this problem of hidden, hidden mediating variables. If we allow for mediating variables to sit in between and have um, sit in between other variables in the graph, um, we get this annoyance that we can always remove hidden influences from any, um, from any graph. So given any model, I can create another model that has no hidden influences. Um, simply by taking a variable and its parents and interjecting a new hidden variable, which is nothing but the tuple of the original parents. Um, and just carrying through the, uh, the dependency. And it's easy, to, it's easy to see that there are no hidden influences in this, um, in this graph, regardless of what the dependency was to begin with. So we have to deny this kind of setup. We basically have to excise um, mediating hidden variables. But it's trivial to do so because I'm assuming all variables are um, deterministic functions. Um, except for the, the primordial ones, the, top, the ones at the top of the graph. So if I have such a graph, I can easily go back to this graph by just writing X directly as a function of A and Lambda. And so there's sort of a straightforward algorithm to do this, to start with the parents of a variable and work upward until I have only observables or what I'll call primordial hidden variables. And that effectively excises the, um, the mediating hidden variables. So that's a, that's a necessary assumption, but I think a quite reasonable one to simplify graphs. And with that, we can now enumerate all the possible graphs of interest. First of all, I'm going to do this only for partition models, meaning the Bell representation, as opposed to the Cochin Specker representation. As I said earlier, this is, this is fully general. Um, that's not to say we couldn't end up with a different variant of contextuality using the KS representation, because we're then talking about different kinds of graphs. But the KS representation is tricky because a, a given measurement, a given observable is sometimes observed and sometimes it's hidden depending on the context, right? Um, depending on whether that observable is observed in that context. And that leads to sort of some um, subtleties that are, that are difficult to deal with that we don't have to worry about in the Bell representation. So in the Bell representation, we again have three types of nodes. We have settings for each observers, outcomes for each observers, and some number of hidden variables but because of the argument I just made for excising mediating hidden variables, I only have primordial ones, ones with no parents. And I can just conglomerate those into a single variable, just a composite you know, product variable. And therefore, um, I have only these nodes in the, in the graph. One other assumption I make, which, I'm, um, which I would like to, um, I'd like to deal with, but for now I'm just excluding superdeterminism, by which I mean there are no causal influences on the observer settings. Um, I hope to generalize to, to allow for those, but I don't have that yet. Um, and under those assumptions, these are the uh, exhaustive set of possible connections in any graph that we might want to consider. We have local settings uh, within one observer from their setting to the outcome. We have source dependence. So this so far is just the standard Bell local model. Then we have parameter dependence, which is what we've considered in our um, in, in, in the first half of the talk. And then we have outcome dependence. And this is everything we need to think about. And so by considering different subsets of these connections, we can enumerate the possible graph structures. So we have the Bell local model that has no parameter or outcome dependence. We have GPD, the parameter dependence model, which is that partition model I covered in the first half of the talk. Then we have models that allow just outcome dependence in one direction or another for each one of these red arrows. And then we have models that allow both. And then finally, um, there's a whole array of other models we can define by allowing only a particular subset of these connections of each type, parameter and outcome dependence, um, possibly motivated by considerations of the physical system under study. For example, you can take a legate guard type of scenario where there's a temporal ordering to the measurements, and we might want to allow dependencies only in the forward direction. So the, the question then, now that we've enumerated these graphs, is what variants of contextuality do we get from each of these graphs or graph families? So in the local model, there's no hidden influence to consider because there's no non-local dependence whatsoever. Um, and so we know this, is, um, this model just corresponds to Bell locality or KS contextuality. 
In the parameter dependence model, this is the one that I've, I've already gone through. This corresponds to contextuality defined with respect to this um, graph corresponds to M contextuality and CBD contextuality. But it's these other families involving outcome dependence that um, we haven't explored yet. And it's these two that I wanna focus on now. So the parameter and outcome dependence model, the fully saturated model is strictly stronger, contextuality with respect to that model, to that graph, excuse me, um, is strictly stronger than M contextuality. It's stronger because the GPD graph is obviously a subgraph of the GODPD graph. Um, and it's strictly stronger given the example that I'll show you on the next slide. So the set of G, G contextual systems is smaller, but it's not empty, right? Here's an example of a system that is contextual with respect to this graph. I sort of adapted an example from Jabbar and Kiala. Um, I turned it into a Bell scenario where there are three settings for Alice and it's a single ternary um, variable for Bob and it has this dependency, this arrow gives that dependency. And um, there's no way to model this without hidden influence. So we do have a non-trivial extension of contextuality, but it's not a desirable one because it doesn't agree with KS contextuality. In particular, they are KS, there are um, non-disturbing KS contextual systems that are not contextual under this graph. And we can do this with the PR box. So we can build a model of the PR box um, that actually uses just this subgraph where um, the hidden state determines A and then B just depends on, doesn't even depend on the hidden state. It just depends on, um, on big A and little a and little b in this way here. And this dependence is fully observable. So there are no hidden influences, um, which renders the PR box non-contextual under this graph, which is a non-desirable property. So in summary, for this ODPD family of graphs, um, the definition is non-trivial, but it's still too restrictive in that certain, certain um, KS contextual systems end up being non-contextual. Let's move to the outcome dependence graph. This one, this graph is also too flexible in that once again, we have um, KS contextual systems that are um, G non-contextual under this graph. And we can do it for the PR box. Yet again, PR box is super useful for building examples. Um, in this case, we have Alice's outcome depend on both her setting and the, um, and the hidden state. And then Bob's outcome depends on the hidden state, uh, depends on, on, the, on these three variables and no longer depends on Alice's setting, um, but it, depend, it has this dependency structure um, that once again, if you look through it, has no hidden influences. All the influences um, of the observables um, go in the same direction for different values of lambda. So nothing is hidden, everything shows up in the marginals. Um, so it looks like allowing for outcome dependence um, gives us different definitions of contextuality, but they're a little too restrictive. Right? They, don't, um, they don't agree with chaos contextuality. Now, a couple other things I've, um, I've considered. If you look at this model, you'll notice that there's dependence of A, um, of, of, of Alice's outcome on Alice's setting. And that dependence goes in opposite directions for different values of lambda. And you might argue, oh, that's a hidden, that's a form of hidden dependence. It's a local hidden dependence, which I hadn't considered before, um, hidden influence. And we could, pro we could talk about prohibiting that. Now, I think that's conceptually problematic because settings corresponding to actually different observables, like different poly matrices, for example. Um, and so changing, changing your, your measurement apparatus or just arbitrarily relabeling your outcomes um, would yield a form of hidden influence under this definition that I, I think is a, an unnatural notion of hidden influence. Um, but on the other hand, these are, these are theoretical considerations. And so from a purely operational standpoint, it might be sensible to consider this kind of prohibition. Um, so I consider that, um, but it doesn't really help matters. It actually makes the, the outcome dependence graph too restrictive. Now we have the opposite problem where non-contextual, um, non-disturbing systems can be, can be contextual under this graph. So here's an example of that. This is another two by two Bell scenario that has a, um, this is non-contextual. There's a, there's a simple um, KS non-contextual model where I don't know how quickly people can, can read through this. I don't want to spend time on it, but, but A1 and B1 are positively correlated. A2 and B2 are positively correlated. And those pairs are, are oppositely correlated. And that's how the model works. But you can prove that under this outcome dependence graph, there is no um, non-contextual model if we deny local hidden influence. 
You might ask what happens if we deny local hidden influence for the GODPD model, the saturated graph. Um, I keep saying model when I mean graph. Um, but in that case, that, um, that graph still stays too flexible, right? So we have this sort of, I don't know, Goldilocks problem where everything is either too flexible or too restrictive. One last thing I considered is just searching for any sensible notion of contextuality beyond the M contextuality, CBD contextuality that we already have, um, combining G contextuality with the no fine tuning principle, right? So the new fine tuning principle, as I described earlier, um, coming from Wooden Speckens and then Pearl and Cavalcanti, is that independence relations in the observables um, determine um, which causal connections are allowed. So no fine tuning allows us to use the empirical distributions to give us what the allowable graph structure is. So rather than choosing the graph structure in advance, as I've been doing over the last 10 minutes or so, we can use no fine tuning to tell us what the graph structure is and then ask whether under no hidden influence, so combining these two principles, whether that graph given no fine tuning admits a G not contextual model. So a nice property of this approach is that um, from Pearl and Cavalcanti's theorem, it will automatically agree with KS non-contextuality, um, but it doesn't help for general systems, systems where there are no exact independence or conditional independence relationships, because then no fine tuning will just give you the saturated graph. And one really strong result we can prove is that if we consider only binary observables, um, any system admits a G non-contextual model on G ODPD. Um, meaning we can we can make a we can make a graph with no hidden influence, not even any local hidden influence of any system of binary observables whatsoever. So this graph is just too flexible. Um, so the corollary here is that this this notion of G non-contextuality under no fine tuning is um, um, it leads to everything being non-contextual as long as the observables are binary. Okay. Um, so a number of discussion points that I'll just sort of um, quickly say, and then hopefully this will spur some um, some discussion. Um, so I think you know one of the one of the real values of this approach, this probabilistic causal models approach, is that it gives us a no-go interpretation of extended contextuality, putting it on a similar footing to the original contextuality theorems coming from Bell, Koch, and Specker, and, and subsequent work. Also. Um, Aside from the specific definitions that I've given here of M contextuality and, and then the corresponding definition coming out of CBD contextuality, there's a translation between the two approaches that allows us to take definitions in one and recast them in the other. CBD has, gone, has undergone um, revisions over the years, and there are different definitions of CBD contextuality that have been proposed, and each one of them has a different corresponding definition in um, a variant of M contextuality. And so I think this kind of translation is useful for um, an exchange of, of, of ideas and um, building up unified theories. Another strength of the model-based approach is that it's naturally suited for finite data sets. If you're running actual experiments and you want to ask, there's a statistical inference question, a hypothesis question, testing question of whether a data set is um, consistent with non-contextuality. And this model-based approach naturally uh, leads us right into um, tools for model selection that allow us to answer those kinds of questions. Now, stepping back a little more philosophically, restrictions on direct influence are essential to all approaches to contextuality. Um, as I've said, they're, uh, they're a premise in the Bell and Cochin Spiker theorems. Um, they arise in uh, the no fine tuning approach and no hidden influence and CBD approaches as being data-driven rather than being um, a priori. And there's this distinction between um, limiting them all together as in standard contextuality for non-disturbing systems and then just giving upper bounds for them in these approaches to, um, um, uh, to extend it uh, to non-disturbing systems. Um, and that leads us to questions of whether the, the particular restriction on the strength of direct influence that comes from the no hidden influence uh, principle, um, what I'm, I'm curious what people think of it as a physical principle, right? Um, I think principles like no fine tuning are, um, well, first of all, relativity, space like separation, and so on is very well supported. Um, so as, as used in, in Bell's theorem, 
Um, the principal use of the no fine tuning approach, I think, is pretty intuitive. You have an, if you have an exact, co there should not be exact coincidences in nature. But the no fine tuning principle, it, sorry, the no hidden influence principle, is a much stronger claim. Um, one might argue that why couldn't there be causal influences that that ever work in at least partially opposing directions? So this is a much stronger physical principle, um, and I think it um, gives us realizing that this principle is what CBD embodies um, gives us an, a new way of thinking about um, anyway thinking about CBD. Um, another problem here, I think, is is that what what this work has revealed is that. Um, when we're talking about direct influence, limiting direct influence and, and prohibiting hidden influence, um, we're a priori excluding outcome dependence. We're only thinking about this parameter dependence type of, of hidden influence. And, 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 and one might wonder, what is the justification for a priori excluding outcome dependence? Um, it seems to me more, um, Marion, I'll, I'll turn to you in just a moment. Um, let me just say this, this last point and, and be done. Um, it seems to me more plausible to, um, more appropriate, I guess, to, to use considerations of the physical system under study to think about what causal influences are, um, um, are theoretically relevant for any given scenario, and then use that to determine what sort of graph structure we want to consider um, in order to determine what counts as, um, or in order to determine what definition of extending contextuality um, we want to use. Okay, so let me leave it at that. Thanks everyone for your attention and uh, let's open up for questions. And I guess, Marian, you have something you wanna start off with? And you're muted. Oh, I, I'm sorry, I, I'm muted indeed, yeah. I, I wanted to say thank you very much, Pat. And uh, I'm opening the floor for questions and comments. Uh, I stop recording.